Mega Mac here on Birds 365. And we got our guy, Marcus Hayes, from the Philadelphia Inquirer and WIP. Good enough to jump in with us here early on a Wednesday. And yes, Marcus, I was listening to you plenty on WIP this week. Uh, fun fun listening to you as well. Uh, did, a, did a nice job. You were with some good guys. Um, one of the things that certainly got discussed, I know we're, we're going backwards in time a little bit here, but was... Eagles tell the fans to blank the <laughs> fuck up. Um, it, it, up. There's so many different angles to look at this, whatever. Here's the first one I want to ask you about. Should the Eagles have even gone there? Even if it was wrong and the fans should know better and they, it does make it whatever percentage it is more difficult. Don't they have like bigger fish to fry? Don't they have more important things that they need to figure out? As to whether or not the fan should or shouldn't be chanting on thir- on a, a down at home and make it a little bit more difficult for the Eagles to make their calls, it w- was it became a pretty damn big story and a cause celeb. Should it have? Well, I'll, I'll answer your question and then I'll uh, disagree with your premise. Okay. Um, your your uh, your question is: Should it be a big deal? And I, my answer, I guess, is no, because it's it's a very – and this is the, the disagreement with your uh, your uh, premise. Right. There is no argument. I mean, there is no, like, okay, there's, there's an argument for them to be loud. I mean, this should be just like a statement, and every single fan to say, hey, you know what, you're right, number one. Number two, the other part about your premise is – Okay, they're they're fixated on this and not taking care of the other stuff. That you could do both. You know, yeah. I mean, it's the, to, to to presume that they can't do both is kind of ridiculous. So it didn't distract them from like figuring out a game plan, but it is distracting. I mean, think about it. Jason Kelsey has uh, six false starts. Five of them are at home, and he was the guy who said it first. And he's the guy who's got to hear the quarterback. I mean, this is not a debate. This is not a, this is not a, oh my gosh, we should be able to do this. It's dumb. It's uh, indulgent and it shouldn't happen. It's the opposite of home field advantage. And I can't imagine another city where we'd be debating this except Philadelphia. Yeah. Here's how I described it, uh, Marcus. If you want to call yourself a smart fan base, you got to be a smart fan base. You got to, you got to understand that. If if not, pay your money and do whatever you want, but don't call yourself a smart fan base. That's how I described yeah, it. This I mean, is not a debatable issue. Yeah, it's I common mean, sense. I mean, you're 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 quiet when the offense has the ball, then go nuts when the defense has the ball. But and not and the Eagles aren't the only fans who do this. No. They're the only fans who think they have the right to do this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we see quiet please signs in other stadiums, and then they get quiet. You know, the the biggest. I, the most repeated move in, uh, I think it was Brett Favre's career, was the bird, where he'd always go like this, be quiet, you know? Because, yeah. you know, the best fans in football are Packers fans. And, you know, he they, happy they, they do stupid stuff too, but then they stop, you know? <laughs> yeah, everybody does. D, D Gunn uh, is happy. He called the Packers fans the smartest fans. <laughs> That's right. He's a <laughs> yeah. he's a Wisconsin guy. He's a cheesehead. <laughs> um, all right. I'm gonna set. I'm gonna take you down this road, Marcus. In the scale of zero to absolute, you know what show? Uh, <laughs> where clown is show. this? I wrote that a couple weeks. All right, ago. Clown, show, clown show. show. That works. But we can curse, so I can say shit show too. So oh, clown show, shit show, zero to that. Where is this Eagles current collapse? I'd say it's about a seven. Yeah, I've been in I've been in locker rooms for 33 years. I've never been in one that's exactly like this. I mean, I've been in worse locker rooms, but this locker room is less uh I guess fractured than uh shell shocked. I, I don't think they can believe what's happened and what continues to happen. So what's the root cause? 
if you need to get to the bottom of it, and Nick Sirianni's trying, Mac and Mac are trying, Jeff Lloyd's trying, Harry Rose, so everybody's trying to come up with the root cause that your description, if it's accurate, which I think it is, uh, is what it is. What caused it? Well, I think there are three issues. And, you know, they're the three issues everybody's sort of talking about. Number one, you've had a, a coaching staff with significant turnover and uh, chronic predictability. Okay. So the the two most the two most common plays that fail by the Eagles are I'm sorry, the most common play that fails from the Eagles is Jalen Hurts keeping the ball. They they fail about they don't get their opportunity out of about 50 or 60 percent. And it's not hard to figure out when he's going to keep the ball. And nobody cares if he keeps the ball much anymore because he can't really break it. He's not as fast as he used to be. But they run that play two or three times a game, and it works maybe once. I'm not talking about him breaking the pocket. I'm talking about him being having a design problem. Right. So to me, that's a coaching failure. Okay. Uh, number two, Jalen Hurts isn't. Uh, I think you were uh, you were discussing this before I came on. Jalen Hurts is making less the, the the he's not making the best decision every time, and he's not making the second best decision a lot of times, or hasn't. Um, and third, you've got a lot of players in that locker room who aren't dealing with it well. It's not just AJ Brown, you know. It's Hassan Reddick. It's um, Devontae Smith. You know, people were like, oh, it's great. Devontae, after a win, said they got to do this. They're not that good. You are what you are, you know. So when you get a win, being disgusted with it sends a bad message, I think, number one. Number two, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the game in which he got yelled at by his coach. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, God bless him, all of them, they're young men. Most of them haven't dealt with much adversity. And they're old men. A lot of them are, this is going to be their last best chance. So those are the three facets for this collapse going, you know, four and one and four in the last five games and really kind of underperforming all year, except for the Dolphins game. Yeah. Tampa Bay, maybe they were very good in Tampa Bay, but, but you know, was Tampa not, Bay yeah, any good Tampa, when they no. were there? Exactly. Right. So exactly. I mean, that's a really good win. The Dolphins win is a really good win. I would argue that the Chiefs is a really good win too, but you probably don't win that game if the Chiefs catch a pass and if you know Travis Kelsey doesn't fumble because he misses his girlfriend. So <laughs> don't know if that was the case. All right, let me let me follow up with something you just said because I had a, a call last night, late in the night, uh, about Jalen Hurts. The head coach is if he's told us once, he's told us fifty times. Jalen loves to be coached and you can coach Jalen hard that he's a coach's son and he gets it. And we can coach him any way we want. And then when things don't go well on offense, Jalen walks quickly by the coach and goes and sits down and takes a quick look at the, uh, the computer and he puts it down and he stares out into space. Is that accurate? That Jalen doesn't mind being coached and coached hard or is he a guy that is difficult to coach and maybe the coaches are just covering for him? Uh, I have no uh, evidence that he doesn't like to be coached hard. I don't know that that example indicates that he doesn't like to be coached hard. Um, my impression is that when Jalen makes a mistake or things don't go right and he comes to the sideline and he goes and sits down after looking at the th he understands what he did wrong. You know, he's a really smart quarterback. He understands what he did wrong or, or what what not even what he did wrong sometimes, but what could have been done better. So I don't know that you need to go. I, I don't know what the expectation is there. Do you want the coach to go yell at him? Do you want the coach to yell at him when he's coming off the field? Because that really doesn't happen. I mean, most most players, the, the Jalen's behavior on the sideline is unique only in that he doesn't engage with his teammates or coaches proactively much. Right. So I don't know that that has anything to do with the coaching. Well, let's talk about the coaching, uh, Marcus. Um, you know, go back to 2021, the tough start of the Nick Sirianni era, took the step back, gave the play calling over to Shane Steichen. 
his explanation. He wants to be a better game manager. And I think he, he, I love that. I tell Jody all the time. I like the CEO coaches more than hiring the scheme guy. Yeah, However, I, I I'll say this, the game management hasn't been great over this stretch. <laughs> um, you know, after the onside kick, everybody's focused on that. That wasn't good. Go back to halftime with Jalen Hurts uh, uh, not getting out of bounds. They got bailed out by a penalty. Um, a bunch of examples of the game management sort of going askew. He had no timeouts at the end of that game. Um, what 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 do you think of Nick Sirianni during this stretch? Well, I, I'm very reluctant to blame Nick Sirianni for Jalen Hurts not going out of bounds. Yeah. Um, I think Jalen Hurts and everybody else realized that was – and again, you know – this is Jalen Hurts' fourth year. If you believe Jeffrey Lurie, <clears throat> quarterbacks don't develop into what they're going to be until after four seasons of starting. So this is really his third season of starting. He made a mistake. Nick Sirianni did not want him to slide there. Um, the mistake Nick Sirianni made was not calling a timeout, you know, 30 seconds earlier than that play, and he admitted that. He's going to call the timeout. He didn't want to leave too much time on the clock. Um, you know, these are very young people in their jobs, okay? And you don't get a, a, a huge honeymoon period or learning curve as a head coach anymore. But these are situations in which Nick Sirianni has never found himself before at any level. And that's one of the arguments against hiring someone who's never been a head coach at any level. So dealing with people, managing people, managing egos – understanding when to talk, when to, when not, when to step in, when not to step in, how to handle crises, that's something you kind of have to live through. And I'm not sure that Nick's personality is such that he's asking a lot of – he talks about asking for counsel all the time. <clears throat> I'm not sure he asks for counsel as much as we think he does because I think he's a proud guy. So I, I think he's learning. I think one of the things he's learned over the last four or five weeks – is that pride goeth before the fall. The most outrageous thing any Eagles coach has ever done is taught the opposing fans in the opposition's stadium, in the tunnel, yeah. for the cameras. Yeah. Okay? That's just not – that. that's the opposite of professionalism and the opposite of maturity. And if you're a player and you see your coach do that, and this is not the first time he's acted – unprofessionally vis-a-vis -vis the fans or on the sidelines or in press conferences wearing t-shirts with messages on them. If you're a player and your coach is doing that, it becomes very difficult for your coach to tell you how to act when he's acting like that. That's a very fair point. Um, but did not Sirianni deal with adversity when they were two and five in his first year and there was a Ewan cry? And I do mean Ewan. Um, for him to be one and done with the Philadelphia fan base here in town. It was what the hell was Jeffrey Laurie and Howie Roseman thinking, who the hell is this guy? He couldn't even handle his first press conference. They were too far. Yeah, people were going, he's never going to be back for a second year. They'll pull the plug on him right away. And they did. They, they calmed the waters and they made the playoffs. All right, they got their tail kicked by Tom Brady in Tampa, but uh, got to the playoffs after it looked like the season was a stone-cold bust. Can we still just give him a pass on he's not handled diversity so far? So we won't come down harshly on him here. I, I'm not sure that I agree with you on that. Well, there's a difference between handling adversity for a team that's supposed to be bad and a, a team that's supposed to be good. It's not adversity when two and five is the expected outcome. It's adversity when 11 and five is not the expected outcome. Two and five when a fan base calling for your scalp. Well, again, if he hadn't been such a goofball in his first press conference <laughs> and if he hadn't had, this was the, if you remember that, that by was the way the week. you blame jeffrey a little bit too because he gave like a 45 minute introduction yeah, he and, and, and nick that. got all nervous but uh go ahead well he's 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 messed up lots of press conferences since so uh that jeffrey wasn't involved in so no i mean that's not adversity that's that's growing pains and it's to be expected uh, one of the biggest, one of the hardest things to deal with, and you guys know this, is getting too good too fast. <clears throat> and I will say this, I was the vocal minority 
about how the team should perform when Nick got here. I thought it was a mistake to fire Doug Peterson. I thought Carson Wentz was the problem. I thought the team I – I picked that team to win 11 games, the one the team that went 9-7 nine and, nine and seven or 9-8 and eight and made the playoffs mm-hmm. Nick's first year. I thought they should have win, won two more games. I thought he, they underachieved. So that's how good a team he inherited. And we see last year with – coordinators who had a year under their belt because there was just as big a hue and cry to fire Jonathan Gannon at the end of uh, uh, 2021 as there was to fire Nick Sirianni in the middle of it. But he had two coordinators who were better, a team that sort of understood itself. They added A.J. Brown, who might be the best player they've had since Reggie White. You know, he's he's just unbelievable. Yep. And they won a bunch of games last year, which I thought they also underachieved. I picked him to go like 14 and three or something like that. And they almost did. And I picked this team to go 15 and two. <clears throat> so that said, you know. Yeah, Jeff Lloyd wants you to report has- to his office. You're setting the bar too high, Marcus. Yeah. 14. You keep putting out these numbers. By the way, they did go 14 and three. They should have went 16 and one if Gardner didn't have to play. Uh, so they probably would have been better. Marcus is right. Gardner. And then it, Gardner Minch- oh, Gardner Minshew. Minshew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they lost the two games Gardner had to start, so, so they anyway, were fourteen um, and one with Jalen Hurts. Yeah, so. I don't, I don't, I don't consider Nick having had to face adversity until now, and he's had to face adversity since they lost the Super Bowl, because his offense went away in the second half of the Super Bowl, and then he fired Denard Wilson after he hired Sean Desai, and Boy, that ev- was the man. That, and that. everything has been crazy since then. Even the ten and one start, people weren't satisfied with, so you can qualify that as adversity or, you know, missed expectations. I've asked John about that a couple of times. Would Wilson have come back if Sirianni said, yeah, come on back? Or do you think that no, that was, was a was mutual fired. He was on the staff, yeah. They they, they, they let him go. Yeah, that uh, that's one that doesn't get And they enough. let him go as a defensive backs coach. Yeah. So he had already failed to get the defensive coordinator job. Right. They hired Desai, then they fired Wilson. Yeah, which, yeah, I think they paid a price. Yeah, well, clearly it didn't work out. I mean, I mean we don't they, know how they, good they, or bad. We don't know how good or bad Denard Wilson would have been as a defensive coordinator, but you know, he's the guy that created Reed Blankenship. Yeah, you know, Reed Blankenship was playing great last year. He's had he's had a terrible season this year. He's the guy that deployed and prepared. James Bradbury to be the best James Bradbury James Bradbury had been. Good point. So yeah. you know, so many career years last year. James yeah, even if he, and CJ Gardner Johnson, he's the guy that kept CJ Gardner Johnson sort of under control and used him optimally. CJ Gardner Johnson loved Denard Wilson. He did not like Jonathan Gannon. Um, CJ, <laughs> well, yeah, CJ was an interesting character, but he was a playmaker, man. He was. Yeah. And, and certainly, uh, Denard was a big, uh, part of, uh, keeping him somewhat under control. I would agree with that. Um, I got to get to number 11 with you. You just mentioned him. I'm with you. This is the best pure football player on the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, clearly he's frustrated. You wrote about it at inquire.com. What is going on with AJ Brown? And why do people have so much of a problem with A.J. Brown? Because he is the best player that this organization has had in a very, very long time. You went back to Reggie White. I'm trying to think. I mean, you might Brian be right. Is- maybe Brian, maybe b Dog. yeah. I mean, this type of player doesn't come around very often. Yeah, he gets frustrated, but you know how accommodating he typically is. Uh, very well- open. But that's the um, thing. I don't think people have a problem with A.J. Brown as much as A.J. Brown has a problem with people. I mean, A.J. Brown was the one who said, I, you know, my mama told me or grandma told me not to say anything if I don't have anything yeah. good to say. That yeah. means he has bad things to say. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and he won't say them. And then he didn't say them for, like you said, he's usually very accommodating during the week. He blew us off during the week and he blew us off on Sunday. And then Nick Sirianni talked to him within the last 48 hours, or the, I guess 72 hours now, according to Nick's radio show yesterday. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. It's uh, 
the world like a white house turning. press presser they announced it aj announced he's going to talk today <laughs> oh is that right yeah yeah oh well great on social media now you got to get down there well, so I, 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 I don't think i can make it down there today yeah. one of the reasons i can't make it down there today is because we asked aj on sunday are you going to talk this week and he made it clear that he had no plans to talk this week yeah, yeah. it changed so I, I don't know if i can get down there but um again aj has issues with something I was told by his teammates that it's with the coaching. I don't think that's a big stretch. I mean, we see him reacting to play calls on the field all the time. And um, I guess to his credit, he doesn't want to start more than what we're seeing. But um, there are a couple of players on the team I talked to, one of whom I quoted on background. When you're a captain and a leader and arguably the best player on the team, your body language matters. Oh, yeah. So, you know, AJ has been a great player and a great example on the field and a pretty good example off the field. But the the blow up on the sideline with Jalen re resonates more now and his distaste or disgust with what's going on on the field resonates more now. And it's only amplified when he refute not only refuses to talk about it, but says, I'm not going to talk about it because I have bad things to say, then says there's nothing really to talk about. Right. And we can we don't have to be all that in tune to read between those lines right there. Um, how much of that falls on the coach? They should have known when they were acquiring him, you're getting a diva. This guy's a diva. He's a talented player. Oh, my God, he's more talented than they even thought. But you do want to be able to – manage him better than the Eagles have. And the fact that everyone like Marcus said and Jordan McDonald, John McMullen go, he's not talking. That means something's really bad. Something's rotten in Denmark. How much of that falls on Sirianni, the wide receivers coach, the offense quarter, whoever you think needs to be included in the, you guys and Jalen, who's supposed to be his best buddy on the planet, that these things have become as big an issue as they have. It, it, do you just throw it back on a player and go, you can't act like that? You, you know it's probably not going to do any good by telling them you can't, but how do you massage something like that and make this less of an issue with a volatile individual and a super talent like A.J. Brown? Well, the, the beginning of your, uh, the beginning of your uh, question, you say, you know, they knew he was a diva. I, I recall... Should have. I, I recall in January of last year, after AJ seemed agitated on the sidelines after a big win over the Giants, people asking, why is he agitated after this big win over the Giants? And he said, pointedly, I'm no diva. So anyway, I just thought that that was a, an interesting way that you, you, you put that. Um, Does Marcus Hayes consider him a diva? Oh, he's a wide receiver. He has, he has two signs on his locker that say open. Always That's open. True. Oh, right. Always oh, open. Is, always say, open. Oh, nobody else has those signs, That's which implies <laughs> that it doesn't matter what these other guys are doing. <laughs> throw me the ball because I'm always. By open. the way, he should have took that always open sign down when he stopped talking. Because if you're always right, open, closed, you got to be right. always, yeah. yeah. I mean, his Twitter and Instagram ha handle has like one something always, always open. open. Yeah. So I mean, not only is he a diva, he's a diva that, ex and I enjoy divas. I don't care if you're a diva. You know who's a diva? Hugh Douglas was a diva. You know, he was great, but he was a diva. You know, he needed certain things. And, uh, yeah, most quarterbacks are divas. So, anyway, yeah. all that said, um, is it Nick Sirianni's responsibility to manage him better? Yes. It's also Jason Kelsey's responsibility. And it is uh, Jalen Hurts' responsibility. And I'll give you two examples of how that's worked well in the Eagles locker room in the past few years. When they acquired Darius Slay, the defensive players went to Darius Slay, Brandon Graham and um, Fletcher Cox, and I think maybe one of the offensive linemen and said, listen, this is your reputation. We don't, we're not going to judge you on your reputation, but this is how we do things here. We do things here this way. It's team first. We don't care about coaches we don't care about uh playing time we don't care about anything except the team winning that's been the existence for us since doug peterson threw rodney mcleod and zach Ertz under the bus 
after the loss in Cincinnati where Zach Ertz ran away from Vontae's perfect. We've, we've owned this locker room as players. That's how it works, okay? C.J. Gardner-Johnson comes in. Who's one of the guys that goes to C.J. Gardner-Johnson and says, listen, it's about the team first? Darius Slay, okay? So this has been a locker room that has capably policed itself for about seven years now. And I don't know that it's doing that as well anymore. I don't know if A.J. Brown is policeable. You know, if that's a word, um, mm -hmm. but, and I don't know that he hasn't been policed and honestly, like AJ Brown isn't, you know, burning down the house, you know, he's upset. My understanding is he's upset with the way the plays are being called and how he's being included and he's declining to burn down the house and he's implying that he wants to burn down the house. Yeah. So there, we've seen a lot worse. He's not doing sit-ups in the driveway. No, no, he's not that level of diva. I, I will, I will say that. Uh, but you're right. You know, to me, with AJ, it's about, it's not about targets. It's about spots. He wants the ball in in big spots. He wants to be the guy. Well, let's talk about that for a second, okay? Because yeah. I heard you guys talking about this before I came on. The two worst losses, I think. I mean, the just loss is bad, but the two worst losses, considering the situation and how they lost, were against the Seahawks and the Cardinals, right? So, against the Seahawks, new yeah. defensive coordinator Matt Patricia leaves James Bradbury on an island twice for the two big plays, mm -hmm. okay? the two big plays that cooked them, all right? That's a coaching loss. That, that decision lost that game. It might have been lost otherwise, but in we look back, that was the biggest mistake that was made. Okay, against the Cardinals, we have two instances where the coaches lost the game. Number one, uh, when it was first and twenty, they started playing for a field goal. Okay, which implies we have a defense that can stop this other team with two, three minutes left. That's a coaching miscalculation. That was wrong. They should have tried to score a touchdown there. And John, I agree with you. The defense isn't great. But the defense didn't become bad in the fourth quarter against Arizona. No. The defense was bad already. They couldn't stop anybody. So you have to coach what's in front of you. The 1999 Rams did not have a good defense, so they outscored everybody. Yep. You understand? It, it, they had lots of sacks, but that's because they were up, you know, 21 points at the end of the first quarter. Yeah. Um, then the other thing, before that final drive, the second-to-last Cardinals touchdown drive, Matt Patricia sent six on fourth – and four from the five yard line and Michael Wilson caught a touchdown pass in one-on-one -on -one coverage. He sent six on fourth and four from the five, a team that can't get to the quarterback has no blitzers and its defensive line. Isn't very good. That is a huge coaching mistake. Gigantic. So if I'm AJ Brown and I'm watching this, we uh, watching this from the sideline. I'm like, what is this guy doing? If I'm A.J. Brown and I'm watching it from the field and I'm not involved at, on first and 20 after I converted third and 20 last week. The week before, yeah. Yeah. I'm saying, what the heck is going on here? If I'm A.J. Brown, maybe I don't react the same way, but he has every reason to be upset with his coaches if, in fact, he will allow today that he's upset with his coaches. At Ink Stained Wretch, one of the great uh, Twitter handles, in my opinion, X handles now, uh, Marcus Hayes. <laughs> you can uh, listen to him on, on WIP, as Jody mentioned. Inquire.com does a tremendous job, tremendous columnist. Um, I'll leave it here. My last one with you, Marcus. Um, it, Matt Patricia. Um, I, I think Matt's probably – a better coach than Sean Desai. I mean, he's got three Super Bowl rings. He's been, you mentioned the experience. He's done it. Um, you mentioned some of the mistakes. But I look at that film, boy. I mean, I saw some ugly run fits that I, I to look at week 17, but think about the players that are out there Shaq Leonard, Ben Van Sumeran, um, Eli Ricks, Kaylee Ringo either young players, inexperienced players, guys who just got here, nobody fitting the run. If I want to take a glasses half full approach, 
Darius Slay is going to be back for the playoffs. Ricks and Ringo aren't going to be on the field. Zach Cunningham is going to be back for the playoffs. Shaq Leonard's not going to be on the field. This defense is never going to be good. It's not a good defense. But can it get anywhere from one of the worst defenses we've ever seen to mediocre enough where the offense can go win some games in the playoffs? Funny you should ask. After game 11, when they gave up, what, 35 to the Bills? Yeah. Right. This defense was ranked, I want to say, 16th in the league, or 18th in the league, 14th worst, okay? After giving up, after playing good teams and giving up 35 to the Bills. In the five games since, they're the third worst defense in the league. So what happened five games ago? The two young defensive tackles played more than they ever have, and they clearly hit the rookie wall. Fletcher Cox got hurt. Darius Slay seemed to slow down quite a bit and was out with surgery, I think, two weeks after that. But the biggest thing that's happened in the last five games is Zach Cunningham hasn't played linebacker. He was probably your second best player through the 11 games on defense after Jalen Carter. They essentially lost their best linebacker. And they've lost four of five games including the one he did play in, but he re-injured himself. He's got a knee injury now. He had a hamstring injury before. They've lost four or five games, and they're the third worst defense in the league in those five games. So that's – if if you want to talk about is there, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel, assuming when Darius Slay returns, he's at 80%, 90%. Zach Cunningham returns, he's at 80%, 90% then yes, there is light at the end of the tunnel. But these guys, these veterans, who don't even have to make great plays, they just kind of have to not make mistakes, these veterans need to be healthy. That's the only light at the end of the tunnel. If Zach Cunningham is as good and or as big a piece as you're suggesting he is, is that a good thing or a bad thing on Howie Roseman's record? Oh, it's horrible. (laughs) I mean... TJ Edwards is playing for $8 million this year. He got a $19 million deal, but $8 million of it was guaranteed in the first year. He essentially signed a one-year $8 million deal, kind of a show-me deal. And I I don't doubt that Chicago, he's their leading tackler. He's their, probably their best defender, second-best defender. I don't doubt that Chicago's going to, you know, sort not, not pick up the option, but allow his second year to vest for like 5.5. Right. TJ Edwards led the Eagles in tackles last year. They went to the Super Bowl and they let him go for eight million dollars. Yeah, John and I have been beating up the Eagles for that. They won. I said yeah. I didn't understand that. I, I thought they would take pride in finding TJ, developing TJ, undrafted guy. I thought how we would take pride in that. Look at what we found. Look at You're what we have did. Rotating running backs and rotating linebackers as long as Howie Roseman runs the team. Yeah. No, and the running backs, they've been okay. Yeah, certainly DeAndre Swift is the equivalent of uh, uh, Sanders, who's done nothing in Carolina. But I'm sorry, the drop off at linebacker this year has been massive for the Philadelphia Eagles. Mark, it's great stuff. We love having you on your show. Whenever you jump in, we thank you for it. Uh, the first time in 2024. Oh, we're going to be having you on again. Thank you very much for doing it with us today. Yeah, I oh. got last day, according to Larry David. So happy new year. Can't get it in. Okay, happy New Year, boys. <laughs> That's Marcus Hayes, Philadelphia Inquirer, and does some hosting on WIP as well. All right, McMullen and McDonald coming back. Um, last night I took some more calls on WIP about Nick Sirianni's got to go. And it just, I, while I'm not dismissive of it and say it has no chance, no shot whatsoever, the, 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 the diligence that people are putting into this continues to surprise me. I know the Eagles stink right now. I know they're in a spiral that they can't seem to get out of. But we got to step back again and take a little bit of a bigger view, a picture of this. Um, the, 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 the... I, I don't even know how you can go down that route. I, I, you, you and I have talked about this. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm no longer at 0%. But the only reason I'm not at 0% is because I think some of the other stuff could fuel Nick Sirianni to say, 
and and essentially do what Doug Peterson did. Right. Said, you, you know what? Good um, following Doug's yeah. footsteps. Yeah. So not that the Eagles would fire Nick. That's absurd. I mean, it really is absurd. It's, it, there's pretty large sample size from 1933 to right now. It, 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 yes, they've lost four or five games. There's been a lot of stretches in Eagles history where they've lost four or five games. There's only one stretch where they want uh, 25 and two with the starting quarterback. Right. Only one. I'm going to give you a stat when we come back uh, to en enunciate the point that both you and I are making on we need to judge Nick Sirianni on everything he's done since he got here. Since he was named head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, let's take a look at the big picture. I uh, just... Because of a suggestion as to who should come in and take over the Philadelphia Eagles, I felt the need to look something up. I'll share it with you when we come back here on Birds 365.